Today's episode comes from a great suggestion from listener Daniel Ritchie. He was on the Facebook group, which is Daily Comedy News Podcast group, and said, you mentioned you never got a chance to talk about Robin Williams when he died, just to catch everybody up. I was between gigs when Robin died. I had, previous to that, been running comedy for Sirius XM, and I'm really used to doing tributes when comedians pass away, and I didn't have a gig, and I didn't have a podcast, and I didn't have the show on Live by Live, so... I had nothing to do other than sit home and be like, hmm, Robin Williams died. So Daniel said, since you didn't get a chance to talk about Robin Williams and he died, how about a filler episode, Robin Williams tribute? I'll even buy you a coffee while you do it. He did buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash news. Much appreciated. So here you go. This is going to be at least a two-parter. Here is part one. Much thanks to the Robin Williams fan site. They have a great archive. That site is robin.williams.net, robin.williams.net. And I found a bunch of old articles. And one thing to pay attention to here, no, I actually prepped for this episode for a change. As you listen, it's so sad because you hear Robin talking about his first wife and then his second wife, and you hear the love, and we all know how the story turned out. If you don't, spoilers, they get divorced. So it's kind of sad as you read through. This first one is from March 12th, 1979, Time Magazine. The article's called Manic of Work, Robin Williams. Five months ago, Robin Williams was what Hollywood likes to call a complete nobody, a struggling comic. He had passed virtually unnoticed through improvisational clubs and two flop TV series, The Revived Laugh-In and The Richard Pryor Show. You would think both of those ideas would work, right? Then last fall... ABC unveiled its new offerings. Robin Williams, 26 years old, was given the lead in Mork and Mindy. The program is fundamentally a retread of such tired sitcoms as My Favorite Martian and Bewitched. Hadn't thought about that? That's dead on. Mork has the innocence and enthusiasm of a toddler discovering the world, but he's one toddler who can talk. Artless, gullible, endearing. He lets the audience in on every transparent thought that whirls through his head. His rambling is wildly unpredictable, in part because Mork talks not only to himself, but to three or four parts of himself, and they talk back. Children love him because his repertoire of Orc language can be mimicked endlessly. Mork's Nanu Nanu has replaced the Fonza's A as the catchword of the nation's kids. Now, I was a kid at that time. I disagree. Fonz was it. I mean, we watched Mork and Mindy, but we weren't walking around going, Nano, Nano. Sorry. Sorry, Time Magazine from 40 years ago. I disagree. It could be argued that Williams landed on the right role at the right time, but Williams is not so much lucky as talented in a stand-up nightclub act, which he does for free to keep in touch with live audiences and to try out new material. He displays a range that encompasses Jonathan Winters, Danny Kaye, Steve Martin, and Daffy Duck. Now, remember, in 1979, Steve Martin is a huge comedy star. Actually, Daffy Duck was a bigger star back in 1979 as well. Though always wearing the same costume, baggy pants, loud shirts, suspenders, he whips in and out of a multitude of comic characterizations. He can mimic the cadences of Shakespeare many foreign languages, an arc of animals, various machines. His act includes a redneck used car salesman, a Russian comic, a gay director, and a touchingly mad grandpa. Mork first appeared when Robin played him on Happy Days in a one-shot. The episode was so big, they created the spinoff. Now that he's famous, Robin Williams tries to live in the same casual way. He and wife Valerie still like to practice yoga, play backgammon and chess, ski, surf, and drive around L.A. for the fun of it. Privacy is becoming increasingly elusive. The other day, he was roller skating in Venice, a funky, fashionable section of the city where people like to walk around on wheels. He coasted into a phone booth to make a call. Remember that? Yeah, that was a thing. But he was quickly surrounded by fans peeking through the glass. He said, I felt like I was in the San Diego Zoo. Robin finds TV's rating struggles frightening. This season, he became fascinated by a short-lived NBC sitcom called Who's Watching the Kids? He said, I saw its birth and death. I watched people fight for it. It's strange for me to know that I'm being used to cut the guts out of other new shows. He's got a five-year contract to play Mork, but he's moving beyond TV. A comedy album is on the way, and next year, he'll star in the movie Popeye. Williams hopes five seasons of Mork will not be too much. He says if you find yourself stiffening up and not taking chances, then you become a situation comedy comedian. What's not going to suffer is his bank account. He makes $15,000 per episode in 1979 money. He and Valerie have bought an eight-room house in Topanga Canyon. However, he hasn't bought a Mercedes or Rolls. He bought a 1966 Land Rover. He says, I can't deal with new cars. I like a car that's like me. You never know what's going to happen next. People Magazine. 
October 29th, 1979, the article Living with Mork, subheading Robin Williams may put on the dog, but his wife keeps him on terra firma. See, this is the sad part I told you about. Uh, It's so melancholy looking back at this. Robin said, it's not the work, but the social life that drained me. I was bordering on exhaustion. I got frenetic. I scared myself. There was no time to recover, no time to go home and say, screw you to a wall. I was starting to go through the roof. You have to say no or else you go slowly bozo. None of TV's breakthrough comedies from The Honeymooners to All in the Family had ever been so dominated by one top banana. The previously small-time comic suddenly could sell out the Copa or the Universal Amphitheater in the blink of a bleem. Nice job. His very first LP, Reality, What a Concept, went platinum. Paramount tied him up in a $3 million-plus five-year contract. He became a national craze. Williams said, it was so much fun, my golden age. But a crazy time of nonstop work and play left Robin Williams drained. He would often leave the Mork set and head straight to the comedy store. We played free shows. Word began to circulate that his marriage to modern dancer Valerie Velarde was disintegrating. The rumors peaked this summer with Robin reportedly with model Molly Madden. While Valerie took off for a few weeks solo in Italy, the gossip stung. Valerie said, the rumors are completely false. The press was like a big fly buzzing around. They print those things because it sells. It's scary. A longtime family friend, actor Stan Wilson, says those false reports of philandering are hard on Valerie. When it comes to women, they've always liked Robin. He's a flirt on set, swatting Pam Dauber's bottom or ogling the ever-present lovelies. Valerie says, do I get jealous? There are some people in the world who belong to everyone. Of course, most of them are responding to Robin's talent or to Mork. I love Robin the person. He's a joy to live with. When the two meet, they often run toward each other in slow motion to embrace Robin says she's very special, basically an artistic, gutsy, down-home woman. Their lifestyle has changed surprisingly little since Mork. They moved from their rented beach apartment to a modest, under $200,000 canyon home. Robin describes the house as rustic bordering on funk. His old Austin Healey was stolen, so he bought a silver BMW. He had to give up his trademark rainbow suspenders because he was recognized too easily. Kids would ask him in supermarkets, will you take me back to space with you? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if kids would actually do that. But Mork's wardrobe was based on a star zone, and he still buys baggy pants and Hawaiian shirts at used clothing stores in L.A. He never carries money and is constantly borrowing from friends. One associate says it has nothing to do with cheapness. He just doesn't know anything about money or time. He never wears a watch, and he's always late. He misses calls from old friends because they don't want to pimp you for anything. So he calls them. Friends insulate you from the outside and peel away the crust that gets on you like a ship that's moored. Some of his comedy store colleagues accused him of stealing their material, but Robin says there's no truth in it. Those are all my friends, and I don't want to badmouth any of them. Comedian Robert Aguayo said, I think he's taken things, but he transcends his material. Weekends are his time to sleep and hang around the house, my sanctuary. He body surfs, he runs, he cleans the parrot cage. He reads science fiction or books on Albert Einstein, his hero. Robin says, when you're creating, you just become a vehicle. It seems to come from a divine source, a sense of the wonder of God. A member of his management staff said, Robin Williams did not become a lunatic when he became a star. He started off a lunatic. From 1981, New York Magazine writes, Mork meets Garp. It's near midnight, a catch a rising star on First Avenue and 77th Street, New York City. The audience laughs uproariously as the surprise guest has dropped in at the club to perform. Who would have expected to luck out with Robin Williams? Here he is. After a hard day trying to prove he can be a dramatic actor on the set of The World According to Garp, Robin Williams craves the change of pace. He hungers for the challenge, the thrill, and the tension of living on the edge in the atmosphere he knows best. His mind humming, his nerve endings exposed as he serves up some risky new material. The audience is his fix. One minute, Robin Williams is cavorting in an androgynous black wig with a polka dot veil. The next, he's united nations of accented voices. He grabs his crotch and talks to it, contorts his elastic face through an album of caricatures, and fires off a barrage of gags. Cocaine is God's way of saying you're making too much money. It's funny to see that in print because that's such a famous Robin Williams quote here 40 years later. I want to be in a film called Altered Suits. It's about a Jewish man who takes acid and everything fits. A young woman calls out, did you ever make it with Mindy? He shoots back, girl, that's not real, that's television. You think Walter Cronkite made it with Dan Rather? That's some real 1981 material there, that joke. Sitting unobtrusively at the table is William's wife, Valerie Velarde, who's taping his act so they can analyze it later and learn from the flubs. She says, Robin's unique, I like his mind, he always brings a new dimension to every situation, so life is never dull with him. He's so funny, it's hard to stay mad at him. 
The author changes modes here, writing West 57th Street. It's evening, three hours before Robin Williams' stint to Catch a Rising Star. He's mild-mannered and inconspicuously dressed. No rube get-ups, no rainbow suspenders. He's wearing khaki pants and a blue, horizontally striped sports shirt. He talks softly in an odd, unidentifiable brogue, sometimes little more than a mumble. A psychiatrist once told him he talks like that to force people to lean toward him. Robin said, I kind of make people ask, what's he saying? Once he gets going, he speaks thoughtfully on a variety of topics. He still has two seasons to go on Mork and Mindy. He now reportedly earns more than $50,000 per episode, but there's been a slump in the ratings, Williams said. That was kind of depressing at first because I took it on myself personally thinking, oh God, I'm not funny anymore. At least I realized it was a combination of the other things. They were screwing around with the schedule, changing the time slot every other night. And parents got angry when we started doing all the sexploitation shows written specifically to get little girls running around in tight outfits and me dressing in drag. They lost a lot of people who used to watch with their kids. And some people thought we were heavy-handed talking about things like euthanasia. We had that one show about the robot being unplugged, but he's not about to quit. I still love doing the shows. I'm proud to do them. It hasn't stopped being fun. It became a day job yet. Five years is perfect. After that, it would be kind of rough. The single hardest thing to do is try to keep the same energy and creativity going. In case you're wondering, and I was, Morgan Mindy only went four seasons. At the beginning of the fourth season, Mork and Mindy got married. Jonathan Winters, one of William's idols, was brought in as their child, Mirth. I hated that whole plot. Because of the different Orkian physiology, Mork laid an egg, which grew and hatched into the much older Winters. It had previously been explained that Orkins age backwards, explaining Mirth's appearance and that of his teacher, who was played by an 11-year-old actress. Ugh, awful. After four seasons and 95 episodes, Mork and Mindy was canceled in the summer of 1982. The show ended at 60th place at season's end. Robin said, I have to try new things like Garp, push myself out, you know, the next chance, because my greatest fear is of becoming mediocre, just falling back into the old rut and turning out the same old stuff without really finding anything new. That's also true for life. Just try not to get stuck. This fear of falling back, sinking back into myself. His relationship with his wife has been a stabilizer. In the beginning, there were no managers, no press people, just the two of us. She was important just being there, going to clubs with me, hanging out with me. Now we've gone beyond that into another phase. It's sheer emotional. It's nice to come home to somebody who knows you. I could sit down and not say anything. Sometimes I pass out. The other day, I was wrestling for 13 hours. I couldn't say anything when I got back. I don't have to entertain or do anything. She understands. I love her so much. I look at her sometimes and feel very peaceful. We've been through crazy things, the wild and woolly times. Now it's like, look, land. Garp has kicked off something in me. The really simple things please me now. I like taking long walks, being outside, just doing things with friends more than I did before. It's wonderful. Before, I had to go out and party, perform, and always be on. Now I'm content to listen and sit back. December 1981, dinner time. Robin Williams, a vegetarian who does eat fish, suggests a Japanese restaurant. The place doesn't have sake. No sake. The whole point of this is sake. We try another place at the sushi bar. The conversation starts focusing on issues beyond acting and career. This is 1981. Listen to this from 40 years ago. Robin Williams said, I recently signed a petition to ban handguns. I'm also afraid of cutting programs that benefit people in order to beef up the defense budget. In San Francisco alone, in some parts of the neighborhood where I used to do benefit shows, they're not going to have a lot of programs that they desperately need, and I think there's going to be a lot of street violence. He's also worried about the weapons buildup. The capacity to destroy us all is already there. And the other things, the chemical warfare, the germ warfare, those are more insidious because they'll be used even before the bombs. The Russians are stockpiling. We stockpile. They stockpile. Also, there's the proliferation of terrorism. That's terrifying. That's part one of Robin Williams Stories. Check the feed because you will find part two of Robin Williams Stories tomorrow. Follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your shows. See you tomorrow.